uh, in five years here. As I count them, she may count differently, but I count five books that she is responsible for. Uh, she uh, did uh, co-edited, I should say, and participated and organized in the conference on uh, Callius to Critias, studying late fifth century art. Uh, she has worked on a comparative, uh, excuse me, a, a cooperative volume of uh, the uh, Cambridge Companion uh, to Ancient Athens. She has written with other people a history of the American school. She has put together a book on horses that go with the exhibit that you can still see. Uh, a book for younger audiences about the horse Avra. So that to me is five, it may well be more than that. And if so, she will undoubtedly uh, correct me. But most of us don't write five books in our entire career. And she did it while she was running the American school. And one of the ways she did it uh, is through her cooperative nature and through her strong feeling that students should be engaged as soon as possible. So for the horse volume, uh, students were invited to contribute chapters on specific themes. And like many, but by no means all our directors, uh, she led trips, uh, bringing the students uh, to the Peloponnese uh, pretty much every year. So in teaching and in scholarship, uh, she has not given up one moment uh, of her time while she was also running the American school. She also for a while was the <coughs> curator uh, of part of the Cleveland Museum, uh, again with the and ancient arts, and she has used that skill and that training as well uh, by producing uh, the show on horses, Hippos, uh, which I've already mentioned. So we have her scholarship we have uh, her teaching and we have her museum work all amply reflected in her five years here. Uh, other things that fall under the category I think of when I think of the school's senior positions uh, fall under the heading of thankless tasks. Uh, and all the senior positions at the American school have lots and lots of those. At the end of the day, you can sit down at your desk and see what you did and ask yourself, how many things did I do today that had anything to do with my training as a classical archaeologist? And the answer will come out as a loud and resounding nothing. Uh, you cannot predict what is going to come through the door, particularly if you're a director of the American school. And among the things she has done for us is she has finished off a long-term project uh, in opening up Loring Hall as a new and improved residence for our students and our visiting scholars. And literally hundreds of decisions uh, had to be made uh, during these five years in order to bring uh, the building to a useful and successful conclusion. Uh, the other one we did not predict uh, is COVID. And during COVID, uh, she was very careful, uh, very energetic in making sure that those people who were here at the school could do as much as they possibly could in the library in terms of being taken care of in housing and in feeding them, but at the same time, making sure uh, that nobody was in any unnecessary uh, danger. And one has to say, uh, that the easiest way to judge uh, her abilities there is to look at the results where so little, uh, so few people were affected by that. And finally, uh, she embraced an offshoot of the uh, COVID situation. Uh, she embraced the use of videos and actively participated in making them, uh, made the rest of us do them, uh, and uh, also filmed uh, pretty much every lecture in Coates and Hall. So we now have, which we did not have uh, five years ago, we didn't have even three years ago, is quite a large video library of talks, uh, conferences, uh, and uh, specially designed presentations uh, in literally by the dozen that are now available and make up a whole new aspect 
uh, of our archiving and of uh, <coughs> outreach and uh, interesting a greater number of people in the work uh, of the American school. So that on my list is seven different things that Jennifer has done full time, full steam for seven years. And I would ask you all to join me in thanking her uh, for this magnificent five years of her directorship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, and we all owe you a debt of gratitude for all you have done to the school, which we will celebrate later this month. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you all for coming to the annual meeting of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. It is my honor and great pleasure to present the work of the school during the past two years. The open meeting traditionally begins with necrology, but you will find memorials to some of our departed members in the newsletters on the table outside the auditorium. Nothing can honor more the memory of each of these individuals than the continuation of the work of the school, which meant so much to them. In that spirit, I will highlight the contributions of the living tonight, those who have made the American school the thriving institution it is today with its substantial endowment, its new or newly renovated buildings, its increasing number of fellowships for scholars, and its tremendous new initiatives in outreach. This year, we celebrate our 140th anniversary, and the school has never been more productive in terms of scholarship, more active across all of Greece, and more committed to our mission. So, I would first like to thank the many loyal supporters who have made the last five years a success, in spite of the economy, the pandemic, and now a dreadful war in the Ukraine. I begin with our Board of Trustees, chaired by Alex Zagorias, followed by our Gennadius Library Board of Overseers, led by Andreas Zombanakis. At the helm of the Friends, or Fili, of the Gennadian is Ambassador Katarina Bora, the members of the school's alumni association have always been loyal supporters of the institution, as have various foundations. The Malcolm H. Wiener Foundation, the Packard Humanities Institute, the Arete Foundation, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, and the Mellon and Kress Foundations, to name just a few. Please join me in thanking all of these generous supporters with a round of well-deserved applause. The core of the American School is its nine-month academic program. This program came to an abrupt halt in March 2020 and only resumed 17 months later when we finally welcomed our student members to Athens in September 2021. Many of them had postponed their admission from the previous year and so were doubly eager to come to Greece. One of our intrepid students biked all the way from Sparta just to get here. In the meantime, we had fortunately finished the renovations of Lorraine Hall, the members' residence, and there'll be more on that later. Our newest Mellon professor of classical studies is a well-known figure around the American school, Brendan Burke, who began in, in September. He excavates at Elion in Boeotia and is a professor at the University of Victoria in Canada. He led the central and northern tr Greek trips last fall. The Whitehead visiting scholars this year are Nigel Kennel, who gave a seminar on the Greek Symposium, and Teresa Shawcross, who taught a course on Byzantine Athens. In addition to these trips, last summer we also offered on-site courses in micromorphology and one in site formation and stratigraphy taught by the Wiener Laboratory Director, Takis Karkanis, and Professor Paul Goldberg of Boston University. The students traveled from Thassos to Crete, visiting over 
uh, 300 sites and museums. We had beautiful weather, as you can see in this photo of Methoni, and an array of expert guest speakers. Here you see on the left, Professor Themelis of Messini and Sherry Stocker giving a tour of the palace of Nestor at Pilos on the right. After two aborted trips to Greece last year because of COVID, our third try was successful. It was led by Tom Brogan of INSTAP in Crete and our excellent assistant director, Simone Agrimonti. Tomorrow morning, bright and early, many of these students are off to Ionia and Caria on an optional trip led by our former Whitehead scholar, Chris Ratte of the University of Michigan. After a successful staff outing to Corinth three years ago, this spring we finally managed to have a second staff ectromy, this time to ancient Nemea. Just before it was named the European Heritage Site by the European Union, and the only the second site in Greece after the Acropolis. So now to our 90-year-old residence hall for members, Lorraine Hall, which finally had a facelift and reopened last summer. This was a 5.8 million euro construction project, and it has the following new improved features. We have a new third floor on the annex, which two double rooms and a beautiful apartment that I call the penthouse. Uh, two internal elevators and an outdoor lift from the garden. Uh, a, a bedroom and bathrooms for the disabled, which are AMIA, um, uh, whatever, qualified. And we put in a workout room with exercise equipment, an expanded uh, beautiful new kitchen with uh, uh, chef's equipment. And most important, we finally have air conditioning <laughs> and insulated noise-proof windows. <laughs> Here is a view of the Saloni with its new furniture, artwork, and curtains. And we landscaped all around the building. Here's a before and after picture of the um, garden between what is now McCready House and um, the main building. Now, as John mentioned, we had a robust lecture program ever since COVID started. Um, Initially, all of our lectures were online during that time, and now we have hybrid lectures like tonight's. We continued to offer a series of lectures, new ones like that on ancient Greek painting, which was co-organized with Professor Dimitri Plantsos of the University of Athens, and continuing ones like live from the Athenian Agora, Byzantine Dialogues, and live from the Wiener Laboratory. We offered a certificate to students who watched these lectures, and uh, we made sure that they watched the whole lecture, and then um, they were given um, credit, some, well, not credit, but a certificate, and I've already seen these listed on their resumes. <laughs> and so far, we've had over 400,000 viewers online watching from various media platforms, which demonstrates how eager the public is for educational digital media. Um, we have, I don't want to try it tonight, just a minute, did I go too far? No, okay, that was it. Um, we have our media manager, Constantinos Georginis, to thank for his skills behind the camera, operating the drone, and production work in the studio. You saw an example of this, his amazing work at the beginning of the program. Um, this spring, we were able to offer in-person conferences in Coatsen Hall. Um, you know, was here on the left, the keynote for one on ancient Argos, which was co-organized with the French and British schools by Evan Vance, who is one of our second year students. And the Schwartz Foundation, as usual, has been very generous and it sponsored a series of meetings on urban planning in Athens. Most ambitious on the part of the school is the new Thalia Potamianos lecture series, which has been funded for 10 years by our Gennadian overseer, Fokian Potamianos. The first was here in Athens uh, last winter, and the second 
as was held in Washington, D.C., and the third will be next week in New York on May 10th. The featured speaker is a prominent professor of global history at Oxford and an award-winning author, Peter Frankopan. These lectures will eventually be published, and we are most grateful to Mr. Potamianos for initiating this scholarly project. Now we move on to our actual publications. Uh, in 2021, we published the papers presented at two conferences held here at the school in 2019, which I think must be a record for getting new research into print. Uh, Cambridge University Press published The Destruction of Cities, which was a conference organized by our past Mellon professor, Sylvia Fachard, and Professor Edward Harris. And on the right is Callius Tecritius, uh, with papers on art and architecture of the late fifth century in Athens, which was co-edited by myself and Professor Olga Pogia um, and was published by De Gruyter. Our journal, Hesperia, has a beautiful new look on the cover as debuted in the January 2022 issue. The contents are equally dramatic as seen in this new reconstruction of the interior of the Temple of Ares in the Agora by Professor Andrew Stewart of Berkeley. Two new monographs about ancient Corinth appeared this year, our 51st Hesperia supplement on the Pinakes from Pentascufia by Professor Eleni Hasaki, and another red Corinth volume publishing the small terracotta finds from the sanctuary of Demeter and Corey by Professor Sonia Klinger. And I would just like to point out here how many volumes devoted to this one sanctuary at Corinth have been published to date, thanks to the careful oversight of its excavators, Ronald Stroud and Nancy Bukaitis. This latest is number eight, and we look forward to more. Last but not least, certainly not least, is a new Agora picture book by Colin Whiting devoted to dogs. And as you can see, my pet Atticus is fully absorbed in this latest publication. And on the subject of books, we held a large book sale in February for overstock duplicates and generally outdated books. It was a big success thanks to the Feely the Blake and staff, and our students who worked diligently transporting and sorting the books. And we're very appreciated that effort. Coats and Hall has been the venue for many performances this past year. We again enjoyed the Curtis Institute musicians in the fall, and last month presented a one-actor drama entitled Macriani's Unplugged. We also featured a musical version of the Odyssey by guitarist Joe Goodwin. Oops, sorry. Uh, this is, I'm sorry to say, I think my granddaughter. <laughs> we just got off the plane. Um, okay, uh, we're now truly on a roll with exhibitions, both virtual and actual. The archives department initiated a microsite for an online exhibit celebrating the 200th anniversary of the death of Heinrich Schliemann. This was the work of Natalie Vogekow Brogan and her staff. It includes a series of podcasts, all of which can be accessed on the website. Naturally, we also celebrated the bicentennial of Greece with two exhibits devoted to 1821. The Three and the Brave was a major undertaking in the Macriani Swing celebrating the role of American Philhellenes during the Greek Wars of Independence. It included material from the Gennadius Library um, and a new acquisition, a small-scale statuette of the marble statue known as the Greek Slave, which was once considered the most famous piece of American sculpture. The exhibit was the brainchild of Maria Yorgopoulou and her staff. In Corinth, our Steinmetz family fellow Eleni Gitsas helped to put up a show in the archaeological museum there about the Ottoman era in the Corinthia, um, which will continue until September 30th. 
so you have a chance to visit. The current exhibit in the Macriani Swing, entitled Hippos, is devoted to the role of the horse in ancient Athens. Here you see, um, no, next slide, sorry. Here you see the uh, inspiration for this ambitious show, the horse burials in ancient Phaleron, excavated by Dr. Stella Krisulaki and her team. Um, it, on the right, you see our Wiener Lab zooarchaeologist, Dr. Flint Dibble, taking a photo as our design team begin to place the horse skeleton on display. Uh, here's just one of the cases highlighting Hippotrophia with objects from the Acropolis, the Keramicus, the Agora, and Glyphada. And the, the last is um, a black figure amphora displayed here for the first time. The appeal of this exhibit is its combination of a variety of objects from the disciplines of science, archaeology, history, and art. And I'm pleased to announce tonight that the exhibit has just been extended until January 4th. I mean, June 4th. <laughs> Sorry. I wish it were January 4th. Okay. And we sincerely thank the Lending Museums and Alpha Bank for the extended loans. Again, we launched a series, a lecture series, um, all by experts on ancient horsemanship, and all of which are available on our video archive. Um, excerpts from some of these can be found on the exhibitions, uh, the exhibit's microsite, which is hippos.gr. And it seemed that every lecturer had some connection with horses, and they proudly displayed this in their talks, uh, beginning with our Dr. Mario Yotso, the director of the Florence Archaeological Museum, who so generously loaned to Greece the famous Medici Riccardi bronze horsehead. The exhibit received, for us, um, uh, a huge amount of publicity, both in the press and on radio and television, which so far has drawn crowds of over 3,000 people to the exhibit. This is not counting a number of group tours uh, for students and, and many others, including, this was my favorite, the one for the Association of Retired Cavalry Officers. Um, unique for us, was the programming for families and children, which included visits from Stella, the last remaining carriage horse in Athens, a special treat arranged for us by Anne McCabe and Bob McCabe. This was part of our special tours for families and school children. Many of the labels in the exhibit are specifically written and placed appropriately to engage children. Finally, we produced with Melissa Press, a book for children, um, which you can see over at the exhibition, which is open tonight till 10 p.m. And another book is currently in press, which has 30 short essays on horses written by our graduate students, as well as other scholars who have an interest in horses. Now we turn to the school's archaeological field projects. Last summer, excavations were conducted at five sites, Megalopolis and Pylos in the Peloponnese, Moklos on Crete, and at our long-standing sites of Corinth and the Agora, albeit with reduced personnel since it was not possible to bring students from North America. We sincerely thank Lena Mendoni of the Ministry of Culture and the staff of the various Ephorias who supported our work in the field and during study seasons under challenging conditions. We begin with the oldest site and the fourth of its fifth five seasons, the lignite mines in the Megalopolis Basin. Dr. Takis Karkanis, the director of the Wiener Lab, is one of three project directors, along with Dr. Eleni Panagopoulou, Tarambella of the effort of Paleoanthropology Speleology, and Dr. Katarina Harvati of the University of Tübingen. The goals of this project are, first, to obtain datable evidence of human presence during the Paleolithic. Second, to develop a chronostratigraphic framework, as well as an entire sedimentary sequence of the Megalopolis Basin. And finally, to reconstruct the paleoenvironmental conditions and the geological evolution of the basin during the Pleistocene expansion. 
Fieldwork was conducted mainly in the Koremi and Kibarisi lignite mines. The team of a dozen scientific specialists inspected exposed artificial section profiles inside the mines, but also along the periphery of the basin, focusing primarily on ancient deposits with sedimentary characteristics. In reference to the faunal remains of the Middle Pleistocene, the most noteworthy specimen is an isolated macaque or monkey tooth and a well-preserved deer antler. This particular species of macaque found in Megalopolis has been identified, if you're interested in this, as a subspecies of the Barbary macaque, a monkey that still exists in Morocco, Algeria, and Gibraltar. The species had gone extinct in Western Eurasia, and in Megalopolis is the only evidence of the species in Greece from the Middle Pleistocene, which is 750 to 130,000 years before present. Geological sampling for paleomagnetic dating was carried out at the long profile exposed in the Kiparisi mine site. At, at the Karemi site, there was a large scatter of hippopotamus bones, possibly confirming that the hippo and other fossils from Koremi 6 are the oldest large mammal remains ever recorded in the megalithic basin. Lithic artifacts and fossils were found scattered inside a sand layer, and examples of these tools include back knives, bifacial leaf points, scrapers, and, um, and lots of flakes and chips. Um, what is markedly different from other assemblages of the basin are the completeness of the flakes and the wide variety of tool types, possibly indicating a hunting stand where humans um, expediently exploited a kill and moved on. Karkanis and his team have published four articles in the Quaternary International Journal on their finds. Further south in the Peloponnese, work continued at ancient Pelos by the University of Cincinnati. In the field and in X-ray sampling and conserving the finds from the Griffin Warrior Tomb discovered in 2015. Of the two new Tholoi discovered in 2018, Tholoi VI, that's the one in red, proved to be the most interesting. Uh, a, what they call a special feature was uncovered in the dromos of this tholos, which consists of a long bowl-shaped pit sealed in late Helladic 2A. It was filled with remnants of gold and ivory objects, amber and semi-precious stone beads. Because of the compacted nature of this feature, it is still being excavated. Um, articles on the Griffin Warrior tomb have been published by the excavators Davis and Stocker, including one forthcoming in Hesperia. On Crete, the Synergasia at Mauclaus entered a sixth season under the direction of Professor Jeff Souls and Costis Devares, who sadly passed away at the end of the season. The middle Minoan two structure seen here, and originally thought to be a house, turned out to be a unique building in the annals of Minoan archaeology, a waterworks. The water conduit, identified there by the arrow, was designed to supply the lower town with fresh water for several centuries, actually, according to the ceramic finds. A small lead figurine of a woman in a flounce skirt was found in the vicinity. One of the goals of the 2021 season was to remove a large dump that had accumulated on the site since Richard Seeger's excavations in 1908. And you can see that in the upper left there and along the top. It overlies part of a late Minoan one administrative building, which now appears to continue farther to the north. So work will continue this year on that. Excavation also took place on the summit of the island where a Byzantine tower stood. After removal of the rubble in two adjacent trenches, it was discovered that the tower dates to the Hellenistic period. It measures 14 by 11 meters and contained a sealed deposit of Hellenistic pottery, roof tiles, and marine shells. After being abandoned, perhaps due to an earthquake in the first century BC, it was eventually rebuilt 
in Byzantine times, but on a much smaller scale. The excavator, our director of archives, Natalia Vokekov-Brogan, has concluded that the presence of a Hellenistic tower on the summit of Moaklos confirms its importance as an outpost of a powerful Hellenistic city in East Crete. Turning now to the Agora, I'm pleased to announce that the purchase of the larger plot of land covering the one that was covering the central section of the Stoa Poikile, thanks to the generosity once again of the Packard Humanities Institute. Uh, we hope to commence the demolition of the building uh, as soon as possible. Excavation was carried out in the area of the classical commercial building where further debris from the Persian destruction was found, as well as Ostraca, uh, some with the name of Xanthippos. Here was also found a fragmentary marble stele with an image of a seated man facing a standing woman. Part of inscribed name is preserved and is dated to the fourth century BC. An even more intriguing inscription appeared in the area now identified as the Leocorian. Like the earlier inscribed bases, found rebuilt into the masonry of a Roman tank, the person named may have a connection with the tribe of the eponymous hero Laos. He is to receive a gold crown, quote, on account of his virtue and justice to his tribesmen, end quote. And an olive reef is sculpted above the inscription, as you can see. It is altogether fitting that one of the major topographical features <coughs> of the Agora, complete with identifying inscriptions, which may well have once included the most famous democratic symbol of Athens, the statues of the Tyrannicides, should be found in the penultimate years of its longtime director and much honored archeologist, John Camp, who will be retiring after this summer's season. Congratulations, John, on 28 productive years directing the excavations of the Athenian Agora and a lifetime commitment to the work of the American School. <laughs> and just to show you a very charming object which came from the Agra last year is this terracotta head of Eros. Um, and it became, it was so cute that it became the logo on the excavation team's annual t-shirt. Now, we turn to Corinth. In 2020 and 2021, excavation was carried out north of the theater in um, the air, green area on the map uh, under the direction of the Corinth director, Chris Pfaff. The main feature in this area is a Roman building with an impressive opus sectile floor. It has been called the marble room because of its paving and the marble benches along the wall. After the 2021 season, it had an exposed length of 6.8 meters and a width of 3.8. And we will, um, um, and its uh, excavation is ongoing. And we'll hear much more about Corinth shortly, but first, a special treat. Just two weeks ago, a major find appeared in the fill above the marble room in the trench supervised by Pfaff. And we thank the Ministry of Culture for permission to show it to you tonight. It demonstrates once again the importance of Corinth in the Roman period and how its excavations continue to yield major works of art. You see here coming out of the ground a marble head, which is a Roman copy of the Castle Apollo type. Quite a beautiful object. It is now my distinct pleasure to present to you my successor as the next director of the American School, Bonna Westcote, who I wish were here tonight with us, but maybe she's online, <laughs> a distinguished professor of Greek art at Emory University and the director of the excavations at the Sanctuary of the Great Gods on Samothrace. As if that isn't enough, she is currently the interim director of the Carlos Museum at Emory. I wish her all the best when she takes over the reins in August. 
Finally, I want to thank each and every one of the staff of the American School. The pleasure I have had in directing the school comes in large part from working with such dedicated, talented, and professional people. The school runs smoothly and efficiently, thanks to them, especially during these challenging past two years. Atticus and I will miss you. Now, I am turning over uh, the mic. Do I, okay. To, to a well-known figure, Charles Williams, the Director Emeritus of the Corinth Excavations, who I'm delighted to have with us tonight. He's going to tell you about the genesis of the amazing conservation project taking place uh, in Corinth, and will introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. And following the lecture, I invite all of you to repair to the garden for a reception and again, I thank you for coming. And now to Charles. Before the evening's discussion of uh, uh, of the Roman frescoes of ancient Corinth. I would like to thank very much and warmly uh, those who have been instrumental in doing the fresco project to the point where it is now uh, standing. So many persons have helped so many ways that a list alone is unsatisfactory. But I have no better way to acknowledge them. First and foremost, I extend thanks to Lena uh, Medoni, Minister of Culture, for her enthusiastic interest in the project. To Maria Merzani, head of the uh, Directorate of Conservation, and to Yota Kasimi. She's the director of the effort of antiquities for the Corinthia. Also, many thanks go to Jennifer Niles, director of the American School of Classical Studies, to Panos Telos, general manager of the school, and to Christopher Pfaff, director of the excavations. To Stella Buzaki, who, who was sole conservator of the frescoes in the 1980s, and was the technical force behind the project. I offer special thanks. With her retirement, all work stopped until Rob Roberto Nardi, director of the Centro di Conservazione Archeologica, his wife, director, his wife, uh, Andreina uh, Constani uh, Cobal, excuse me, Kobau, and a team of professional conservators took on the eight-year restoration project. This evening, we are showing the results of the first two years of that work. The excavation in the 1980s was conducted with the aim of learning more about the neighborhood east of the theater. In in excavating the north south street east of the theater, we discovered that there was much of the roadway had been surf resurfaced with the addition of pockets of leveling fill. In those pockets were contained the discarded frescoes that had decorated the theater. The, the pockets contained frescoes that decorated the theater's cavea in the early Roman period. We also recovered many discarded fresco fragments in dump fills that support, 
supported the ramp to the back of the theater, cavea. Those fragments belong to more rooms than we can yet account for. Uh, we then, on the east side of Theater Street, we excavated a large, rather large structure constructed with impressive masonry in which the three rooms contained frescoes which had fallen from the walls. One room had its upper walls decorated with garlands and musical instruments. The most important room of the three is the southernmost one in which appears a group of gods in panels, including Aphrodite, who is shown in the form of her cult statue on Acrocorinth. For further discussion of these frescoes, I now turn things over to Dr. Nardi. Mr. Williams for your introduction. Uh, I would uh, like to go immediately uh, referring to the areas that Mr. Williams uh, spoke about before. The first area is this one, East, uh, East Theater Street and the Odeo Ramp, and this area here. Uh, the first group of frescoes come from this area, and the second group of frescoes come from this area. So these are the two areas which were excavated by uh, Mr. Williams. Um, I would start saying that here I am only a spokesperson of a wonderful group made uh, of uh, several different professionals, a group that is working together since two years in a really wonderful teamwork. Uh, my first uh, reference goes to our friends and colleagues uh, uh, from the Greeks uh, Authority, to Maria Merzani and uh, Iota Cassimi for uh, the close collaboration that uh, they are guaranteeing to these to this project. The second reference go to the team, to the group of the American School Corin project, to uh, Christopher Pfaff, to uh, Yulia Tsonu, and to the conservator Nicole Anastasatu, and to Super Manolis Papadakis for all what they do every day to guarantee the, the perfect uh, implementation of uh, the project. Then, of course, I have to thank uh, my team that is all sitting here. It's a group in total of about 20 different professionals. I'm not going to, to tell their names, uh, except the senior one, who are Chiara Zizzola and uh, Gianmario Porcheddu, who are guaranteeing full uh, and uh, continuous uh, assistant for the success of this project. Mr. Williams before referred to a two years project. These have been strange two years. If I imagine the day that this project was commissioned to me, the first thing I said is uh, uh, so nice. We finally have a project with no risk in a beautiful country, no wars, no arrests, no kidnapping, no terrorism, but then the COVID arrived. <laughs> so uh, let's say that the calendar doesn't correspond exactly to the result that we have been produced until today, because probably when you hear Mr. Williams, who is the most optimistic person amongst all of us, saying that we are working since two years, 
the result that you will see probably will not pay you back for the two years. But trust us, we have five more years in front of us. We only touched less than 20% of the entire collection that Mr. Williams excavated during his uh, excavations. Um, as being uh, first an archaeologist and second uh, a conservator of archaeological sites, I normally spend most of my professional life in the midst of disasters. Disasters because the sites that are excavated and not protected. Uh, disasters because uh, the material culture that is not made accessible to scholars or to public, and I may go on with many different specifications, but I will stop here. So someone may think that our life is depressing. It's not true, because first, for the love that we have for archaeology and for our profession. Second, because uh, once in a while, positive and magnificent uh, projects arrive, and especially uh, well-conceived projects, just like the one that Mr. Williams designed and planned 40 years ago, which is the project for the uh, uh, frescoes from Corinth. This is the project I will tell you about uh, today. The uh, current excavation, the, the area of the theater, was uh, excavated around uh, the 30s when uh, the structures of the theater and uh, the street nearby were unhurted. Uh, after this excavation, during the 80s and the 90s, Mr. Williams started a new excavation uh, around the area of the so-called uh, East uh, Theatre Street and uh, the Cavea Ramp. Uh, these were uh, times where uh, some extraordinary event happened. The first one is that Mr. Williams was uh, immediately attracted by uh, the quality and the importance of the frescoes that he found, and surprisingly, he saved all the frescoes. How many times, according to your experience, uh, frescoes in small fragments are uh, saved, collected, and protected? Very, very few occasions. Another extraordinary event of this project is that there was a conservator acting on site, Stella Buzaki, who did uh, an incredible job for years and years, and she recovered and collected any single fragment. But I can guarantee you that I'm speaking of fragments of uh, two millimeters by two millimeters. We are dealing with these things. I don't pretend that you trust me. I will show you the pictures. Stella, who is uh, comfortably sitting there in a pithos, <laughs> in a matter of years and years, she did really an incredible job, of course, supported by Mr. Williams, who clearly immediately understood the potential importance of these frescoes from Corinth. The second, the third extraordinary event of this project is that a new apotheki has been built in a record time at the service of uh, the excavation of Corinth and at the service of uh, the Fresco project. This is the building uh, that has been recently dedicated to Nancy Bukidis and Stella Buzakis. And uh, this is uh, the quality of the building which finally allowed us to have 
all the spaces we need to implement uh, a such a scale project without problems or uh, interference. It has to say that Mr. Williams waited for years and years and years, I would say at least a couple of the decades, to proceed with the Frescos project, waiting the moment the proper facilities were available. This happened in 2019 when he asked us to come. Uh, so we have uh, two groups of uh, fragments of frescoes. I hope I will not tire or bore you with technical uh, aspects, but I am a conservator, so you have uh, no hope you will have to go with me into technical details. Uh, the frescoes, uh, the first group of frescoes have been uh, excavated in this area and uh, the same typology, same uh, part of the same walls have been found distributed in very far areas, meaning that these frescoes are not in original deposition, they were the result of uh, ancient uh, demolitions and the frescoes have been uh, as, uh, distributed around to produce new floors, new levels to build up a new urbanization. We are talking of fragments of this uh, quality and we are talking mainly of uh, numbers. Uh, this is one of the 365 trays of uh, these uh, uh, materials equivalent to 1,020, 100,000 pieces of fresco that Nicole has been uh, uh, dividing in trays, the Nicole, the conservator of, uh, of Corinth, uh, and making them available to us into a logical system, which of course is extremely helpful. Uh, we are talking of this kind of frescoes with uh, a thick uh, uh, setting bed. We have, uh, on most of them, we have all the original uh, layers and this is the quality of the materials that we are working with. <coughs> Speaking of horses, Jennifer, this is your horse. <laughs> I think no comments are uh, necessary to, to judge this, the quality of these uh, materials. So the first uh, work we did uh, to, uh, with this uh, group of frescoes has been trying to understand what it was about. So we prepare several tables with sand in order to hold the fragments in temporary positions and let us understand the decorations we were talking about. Sorry, this. Slowly, slowly, uh, getting familiar with the fragments and uh, discovering traces of pencil, orientation of the painter, or scratches, or uh, com compon material components of the setting bed. We are uh, slowly reassembling and studying and documenting what is uh, uh, this uh, incredible collection of uh, frescoes. Mm -hmm. 
useless to say, this is a long process, but uh, faster than what one can imagine. Because you spend uh, two months, three months, with apparently no results, and suddenly in one week, you see the panels uh, materializing. Um, this is the work in process. These are some of the panels that have been uh, uh, reassembled on, uh, on sand, and uh, they are ready to be uh, put on, uh, on uh, final panels. Here, just to give a few comments, is uh, the so-called uh, panel with a chariot race. You can see some chariots directed this direction and other chariots going on the opposite. Useless to say, uh, to make comments about the quality of uh, these uh, materials. Uh, this is another example. This frame uh, is uh, 10 meters wide and uh, most probably will decorate uh, the upper colonnade of the cavea of the theater. It's made uh, of this upper decoration and uh, by capitals and uh, columns. Um, of course, a similar uh, experience gives us uh, the opportunity to study the fragments from various points of view, from the iconography and uh, from the technology. Uh, you know how the Romans were boring. They were doing always and only things according to the procedures. And uh, you never find something strange or something different. This is the case of our frescoes where we can easily recognize uh, the strata that uh, Vitruvio indicate as a, a proper technology. Just to give you a few examples of uh, the, some of the uh, information that we are uh, uh, identifying in these fragments, uh, this is the top, of the, the top part of the decoration of what we believe is uh, the upper part of the cavea. And uh, you can see here that there is a, a, a molded decoration on top, and the molding is go behind uh, the painted surface. So this tells us that they first applied this decoration here, and then they applied the uh, intonachino and the painted surface. Uh, here we can see the string that was uh, uh, picked on the surface when the surface uh, was uh, still uh, wet. And uh, here you see the string, but here you see the string cancelled with a spatula because the painter was not happy with the line of the string. This is a small detail that tell us a lot about the skill of these people and how precisely they will work. And we also find uh, some, uh, uh, some scratches here who are the, li the measuring lines. And accidentally, which is not accidentally at all, these are 70, uh, 63 millimeters that when you multiply by four, gives one dextant that is about 25, around 25 centimeters, uh, telling us that they were using this kind of measuring scale, which is absolutely normal. We, don't, we didn't discover anything, but it's always a pleasure to find imprinted in a piece of frescoes what you expect to find. Uh, this is a kind of gossip. These are the same decoration, probably in two different walls of, of the same building, where here this uh, pattern has been done uh, with a nice brush. And here there was a lazy colleague who, instead of using the brush, 
he used the finger to do the same. Uh, the use uh, of a compass with a center and with the lines uh, belonging to these uh, decorations. So this is uh, just uh, a little bit of the mountain of information that we are collecting and that we are uh, getting from this incredible collection and that we are classifying Wait in the moment to make this available to everybody. Going to investigations, we had a, a wonderful, uh, we are having a wonderful uh, collaboration with Dr. Karkanas and, and Dr. Michaelidis of the Wiener Lab of the American School, uh, which they helped a lot us uh, in defining the diagnostic program for uh, uh, investigating the constitutive materials, uh, the executive techniques, the morphologies of the degradation, and others. Uh, at the moment, we made uh, a program for the diagnosis, and uh, uh, we are waiting for the uh, permission release from the Greek authority for waiting for the moment that we will extend our visual investigation to instrumental ones. Uh, that is a, uh, don't tell me what all this letter means because I don't forget there are young experts for this in the team. They will take care. I can guarantee you that with the help or with the Wiener Lab, uh, lots will uh, come out to surprise you in the immediate future. The other uh, completely different category of frescoes was discovered here in those buildings uh, in uh, uh, primary deposition, which means that they were uh, in their own original position when the buildings were abandoned and they slowly fell uh, on the ground. Uh, the, the main characteristic is that all these frescoes are extremely thin. We are about uh, eggshells, as, uh, as in Tonakino, telling us that most probably they were applied on uh, walls finished with uh, intonaco uh, based on clay, and the clay soluted with the rain and only the final finishing, the final uh, intonachino is uh, left in place to today. We are uh, speaking of about uh, 50 main pieces of frescoes to be added to the 120,000 pieces I told you before. Uh, this is uh, a, a photograph showing one of the rooms uh, when Dr. Williams uh, and Stella were uh, excavating this. Uh, this is a grid that Stella uh, designed to help herself in collecting the pieces and in fact help us uh, today uh, in working with this. This is the so-called uh, wall of the garlands. These frescoes have arrived to us thanks uh, to new setting bed made uh, of uh, fiberglass and raisins that Stella applied on site. So all our process is uh, to remove the fiberglass without losing the joints of the frescoes and waiting the process of relaying them 
on a new support, on a new support made of background uh, of uh, lime-based mortar. This is because this way the frescoes will go back into an, a setting bed totally compatible with the original, then applied on uh, synthetic materials. And this way there is no contact between the original and the synthetic materials that we applied and all the process is totally reversible. This is the grid that has been uh, uh, designed to reproduce uh, the grid during the excavation, where we relocated the fragments in order to understand the mechanism of the crushing, of, of the falling of the pieces of the frescoes, trying to understand the iconography of, uh, the, uh, of the wall. Uh, this is the grid at the end uh, of uh, the uh, restitution of all the fragments uh, with many, many overlapping. And on this, we started to work uh, identifying the different uh, decoration in the, uh, in the fragments. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how this mechanism worked, you can see here traces of... Uh, uh, green and, and dark decoration corresponding to three to candelabra telling us that the lower part of this wall, which is this one, was divided by three vertical candelabra telling them that we are dealing with four different fields with a yellow background and with the figures inside. This is uh, after the moving of the fragments. Uh, you can see the fragments related to the candelabra, one here, one here, one here. The four um, yellow background filled. The figures, you don't see the figures, but you trust me, there are figures here and the garlands. So this way, uh, let's say when we arrived at this way and we understood what it was about, only at that time the proper restoration started. These are, I told you, I don't pretend that you trust me, this is uh, one figure that we believe uh, is uh, an Apollo and here we have traces of a lion letting us, of course, thinking to an Heracles. Another group of frescoes we are dealing with always from the same typology of very thin intonaco. These are the drawings of Stella when she uh, recovered them. Is, uh, belongs, is referred to a unit, to a specific room of uh, a unit uh, that has been uh, restored and uh, you will see here the results. So this is how we receive uh, the pieces uh, 20, 30 years after Stella restored them. Cleaning, of course, first step to understand and to read. You can see the fiberglass 
behind. Then fragment uh, joint search for joints. Then temporary fixing of the fragments uh, in order to remove the fiberglass. We need to apply a new veil. This is a wedding way, veil that hold the pieces, letting us the, giving us the possibility to read through. Then the pieces are turned upside down. Very dangerous passage. And then the fiberglass is removed. Then the reverse side is cleaned 20, 30 years after. And the new support we call strato di sacrificio. That means a reversible stratum that in case can be removed. After this, the ensemble of fragments are reunited together in what we call, of course, pizzas, is uh, located uh, in uh, a one-to-one -one scale uh, reproduction of the wall to try the final location. And then uh, the final uh, uh, new setting bed made by lime-based mortar is applied uh, before the application of uh, the uh, carbon fiber that uh, will hold and will give structure to the pieces. And when these pieces are uh, set this way, finally the last step of the work starts, that is uh, the positioning on the final support made on uh, aluminum honeycomb, which is a material that is a very light, extremely resistant, so resistant that the body of the airplane are made of that. But what we like most of this material is that this is used in conservation of mural paintings since 50 years today, which means uh, enough guaranteed instability. So the wall is reconstructed uh, in uh, aluminum and fiberglass and uh, an aluminum honeycomb. The places, the, the pizzas, the pieces are uh, positioned uh, in their final location. And then uh, the panels are cut in sections in order to be easily movable in case uh, they need to be transported from one exhibition or into a museum. We don't cut the lines straight because otherwise you would notice. We try to follow the design of the paintings uh, so your eye doesn't catch up that there is a line over there.
and the final finishing. Uh, the application of a tooth grit, which is inorganic and natural, in direct contact to the aluminum honeycomb. And on this grit, we will apply the final background made of lime-based materials, same composition as same color as the original setting bed of the fresco. So at the end, when you have the lacuna and you will look at the wall, you will think that there is simply the final intonachino missing and you are looking at the actual structure. This is one wall of a room made of three walls that today are standing up in the uh, Apotheki, in the new Apotheki in Corinth. This is the brown is the background that very soon will be filled with gray in Tonaco. The panels are self-standing, so you can exhibit this against the wall or in the middle of a hole. They are light and they can easily be moved. So this first room is finished. There is another one on the way. In about six months, will be ready. And uh, I have the pleasure to show you this first room as uh, it show up today in the Buzaki Bukidi Center for Research. It's a room with uh, the representation of Aphrodite surrounded by other deities or divinities. The future of all this is a new museum, a new center for research for, a, for a wall painting studies that at the end of this project will be built in Corinth. I would like to conclude, I would like Sorry, not for me, not for me. It was a real privilege to work with 
personalities such as Mr. Williams. So it's to him that we have to be grateful for everything. the most modest person I have met, <laughs> and to the person who alone did the work that we are doing in 14 people. To tell you how slow these conservators of today are, so I ask you to join me uh, to give, uh, to deliver our gratefulness to Stella Busaki. Please tell me. Thank you very much. Now, for the next four <laughs> years. And uh, thank you for a fabulous lecture. Thank you, Charles, for being with us tonight. And um, thank you all for coming. And I hope you will all celebrate uh, in the garden down below. Thank you. Thank you.